Okay. Good afternoon, guys. I hope you are doing very, very well. And uh, today we're in for another episode of the Shifts to Success live podcast. And this one's a bit different. We're actually uh, going to be bringing a phenomenal guest who's going to be sharing his story of how he's essentially worked from you know British Transport Police to the NCA to ultimately building a very successful business and working with uh, highly competitive elite athletes in helping develop their mindset and their game. Um, so I'm not going to kind of give too much away. Um, so what I'd like to do is introduce Mark Bowden. How are you doing, Mark? Alex, yeah, really well. Thank you very much for having me on your show. Um, being a big admirer of Shift to Success. And uh, yeah, big privilege to be on it. Thank you. Awesome. Awesome. So no, it's good to have you. Um, so Mark, one of the first questions I love to ask uh, everyone who joins the show is just to bring it right back and to find out more about you as a person, what it was like growing up. Uh, so where are you from and what was it like for you as a, as a child? Wow. Okay. All right. Going right back, right back. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I was born and raised on the mean streets of Plymouth um, <laughs> back in the day. Um, obviously, I said that a bit of tongue in cheek. I had a really good um, childhood growing up. Very supportive parents, which was really nice. Uh, I'm one of two. Uh, my sister is eight years younger than me. Um, and we get on brilliantly, always have done. I moved from Plymouth um, to Portsmouth for university up to, to London for a, for a long time. And it um, seems to me everywhere I go, my sister kind of has a, has a property quite close as well. And, and now I'm back in Plymouth. Um, she's back in Plymouth as well. So like I said, good, good relationship with her. Um, but yeah, and, and very, very supportive parents. Um, and I think you asked about whether or not I was academic. Um, yeah. Do you know what? I've, I, I would say yes. Um, I've always been someone who wants to be in my comfort zone. Yeah, mm. I, I'm trying to get out of that, and I've, I know I've, I've pushed it, but I was always like um, second group everywhere. You know that I've it, it, like if you look at it throughout my whole life, I've always been second group. Yeah, and whether that's um, the the maths groups, mm. or you know within within academia, or uh, when you go into, um, I mean, I love my football, but I was always happy to play a couple of levels below where I could shine a bit where I didn't have to run so much, where I could be in my comfort zone, but excel, if you know what I mean. And um, it's not it's not the best place to be, I don't think. Do you know what I mean? It's it's a comfortable place, but I think what I've done a lot more in my my business life is to take things to the next level. Do you know what I mean? Always coming out of my comfort zone. Um, I, my, probably my biggest fear throughout my whole childhood work life, probably uh, not so much now, public speaking. Mm really really hated being in front of um people and that is it that's my comfort zone so anything there no do you know what I mean and that kind of held me back through childhood I think held me back through um working life and now it's something that I have to do you know even like coming on here you know talking to you um it's being recorded there's there's going to be people that are watching it it's going to go onto a podcast all those sort of things in, you know, if you said this to me 10, 15 years ago, I'd be like, that's, I'm not doing anything like that. But, you know, it's, that's the sort of thing I'm talking about, getting out of your comfort zone to be prolific, if you know what I mean. And mm. um, yeah, so I mean, digressing a little bit away from the childhood, but that was a big, a big thing for me. Yeah. Um, but yeah, when I was growing up, so I, uh, the first job that I went into was as a trainee accountant. Right. I just okay. thought, accountancy it's a good job you know what i mean that's it's it's you know everybody knows um accountancy is a good good thing to go into you know i didn't know what i wanted to do to be fair so when i went into being a trainee accountant it was just because of like it's it's kind of like a the, the thing to do sort of thing mm. and, I, and i remember every day thinking oh this is this is dry do you know what i mean this is, this <laughs> I can is imagine so, yeah, not not my thing at all. And I'd I'd always want had the idea of loving the idea of the police. Yeah. You know? mm. um, so what I ended up doing is because I to go into the trainee accountancy, it wasn't A levels accountancy, it was before all that. Um, so it was like a different way of getting into accountancy. But I decided, right, I want to go back in and I want to do something now I enjoy. It's not about the money, it's not about anything like that, it's about something I enjoy. So I went back and I did um 
higher education like GMBQ, I think it was at the time, mm. in order to get into doing a degree in criminology. Yeah. Oh, okay. That's what I wanted to do, criminology. And I thought, right, two years of doing GMBQ, advanced business, not interested. Not mm. interested at all in business, which is quite funny how it's changed. <laughs> yeah. um, not interested in business, but it will give me the necessary credits, criminology, um, and go on. And I did a criminology degree, did a criminology um, master's as well. Came out of that, went in to try and get involved in um, MI5. So I was going like, to look to become wow. a spook. Um, James Bond. James Bond, yeah. Um, failed. Um, <laughs> <laughs> just, I went for the preliminary stuff. But again, you know, my my heart, I didn't know what I wanted. You know what I mean? So I, I, I turned up to the, to the day, didn't know what I wanted to do. Um, did I want this? Did I not want it? So I didn't go. I wasn't all in on it. And um, I think I failed on the quite early on in the the the, the um, psychometric testing or whatever it is that probably mm. was a bit. <laughs> um, and then from there, yeah. So uh, I did a little bit of all sorts of things. And the first law enforcement area that I got into was the British Transport Police, and went in there as a civilian and on the intelligence teams within that. And um, I was working on the, 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 one of the big things on that was the, the G, I mean, we've got the G7, haven't we, this week down here in St. Ives. It was the G8 in, um, in Glen Eagles. And we were doing a lot of work around that. And I, I was at the area, in, the area um, headquarters, which was in Tavistock Place. And it was, the, so we were literally on the 7-7 the bomb on the bus went oh, off wow. right next to our office. So obviously um, there's a lot of people that we, we took in a lot of the walking wounded, um, those that didn't go straight into hospital. And um, yeah, I, you know, I think there was like two weeks then, I don't know if anybody else remembers being in and around London working then, but I think it was two weeks of, of didn't even go home. You know, it was literally a hotel with inside the cordon zone. Um, I, our um, headquarters was inside the cordon zone um every day walking from the office to the um the hotel that we were put up in it was inside the cordon zone and it was literally a five minute walk to the hotel from the office and that five minutes was walking past the bus every day seeing it like forensically taken down and i mean i know you know it's it's, it's not a, a big deal compared to what a lot of people experienced certainly a lot of the police officers in and around london who were down the tunnels and things it was a it was a big big um big deal mm. um but yeah that's one of my most prominent things of, of remembering within the um the btp and then i moved on to ensis which is the national criminal intelligence service and mm. um that was i went i was working on the northern europe desk there um but that was a very difficult one to get into as well i went on a, a so this is something i was did jump in feet first you know i yeah. really was wanted the national criminal intelligence service job the ensis job and it was a full day of, of testing. And um, there was, I remember there was 12 people that went for that role. And if 12 people passed, 12 people would get roles. If okay. no one passed, no one. So it was like a, you know, there was a thing. And I always remember that day going in and doing it. And I had the nervousness, I had the anxiety going in. And it was one of those days where you feel like, you know, if, 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 whatever I touched turned to gold, if you know what uh -huh. I mean. Just awesome. A really, really good day. Yeah. Everything just flowed. And um, fortunately, two people, well, you know, it was not good for the other 10, but two people out of the 12 got through and, and I was one of them. So I got the role. Again, civilian job within the National Criminal Intelligence Service, working on the Northern Europe desk. So we were looking, it was, this was a lot, there was some high level mm. um, stuff going on. Do you know what I mean? So we're looking at, people trafficking, people smuggling, masses um, of heroin, um, the Albania, um, Pakistan um, link, bringing in heroin and, and people and all sorts. And lots of work there with the spooks, you know, mm. because I'm um, feeding stuff in there. And so that was good fun. Um, but I still, you know, behind a desk, you know, I, I, you want a little bit more than that. And we then transitioned from the National Criminal Intelligence Service into the Serious Organised Crime Agency, where I got my powers, so my cross powers, which was, um, I'm, you know, I'm probably teaching everyone in the stuck age, maybe I'm not, but cross powers were constable, um, immigration and customs. So I had, you know, all those powers, which, which I got there. But still, my role was mainly 
um, on the covert side, but this it, it got a lot more operational. So I was working for an operational drugs team and doing a lot of surveillance, um, building cases just outside of the evidential chain. And I mean, yeah. I know everyone was saying oh, everything's in the evidential chain, yeah, maybe. Um, but you know, I was um, doing a lot of stuff on the outside of that, and um, from there really fast-paced stuff really fast-paced stuff we then became the national crime agency just because of the amalgamation and um i moved down from london plymouth obviously my home i always wanted to move back at some point in my life and when i met my um my now wife she was from plymouth we actually met in plymouth while she was living in london um so she had a um probably a bit of delusions of grandeur from my point of view, but we had a similar job in terms of shifts, but she was, she was a doctor in, um, yeah. in London, the Royal, Royal London. And um, she was down in Plymouth for Christmas and we met and we got on really, really well. And, um, you know, it was like, Oh, this is great, but yeah. I'm going up to London. And she's like, well, so am I, this is where I live as well. Uh, I live in London. So, wow. but she wanted a transition back down into Plymouth at some point, which I did but there was never really a means to doing that. But we ended up going back into, she, we moved down to Plymouth and I was, and I got a transfer to Bristol. Mm -hmm. And it was there that things started to get a little bit boring again. Do you know what I mean? It mm -hmm. was, and it was so fast paced because I was part of a joint drugs team in London between um, SCD 78, which was middle market drugs, but it was the special, specialist crime directorate of the Metropolitan Police mm. with us. And we, some of the jobs were absolutely brilliant, but just so fast paced, lots of stuff going on. Um, still, you know, we're all, we're looking at multi kilos of, of cocaine and heroin into the capital and just brilliant. Then I moved down to Bristol and the jobs were still really, really good, really, you know, high level stuff, but it just was so, it was such a slower pace and mm. I just got so bored with it. Um, and um the great thing about it was, is, is I was living in Plymouth and the idea was, is I, mean, I was moving, I was every week I was working out of Bristol. So Monday to Friday, living in Bristol and going back at the weekends, but it was a means to an end because what everyone has said to me and what my boss has said is that brand, extra branch, you'll get there. Um, as soon as an opening happens, it's yours. Mm. Brilliant. Okay. So just waiting, just waiting, waiting. 14 months have passed um, of which we just got engaged. Me and my wife had got engaged. We're in the Maldives, came back from the Maldives after getting engaged. And I said to my boss, I said, right, look, let's just get this going now. Let's, let's push it through. Um, we, I've, I'm engaged now. I'm ready. I'm ready to move down. We're going to look at a family and that kind of thing. So let's, let, let's make it happen. And he was like, mm, well, since you've been away, there's been a bit of movement going on. Exeter is getting smaller, not bigger. Unfortunately, you'll never get to move down there. So the idea would be now is if you can get your family to move up to Bristol. I'm like, all my family live in Plymouth. All my wife's family lives in Plymouth. Yeah, that's not a possibility. And in the same week, voluntary redundancy started coming out within the um, wow. NCA. And and I was like, I've got to do it. I've got to do this because I had a little sideline on the side of. Um, I was doing like meditation audio sessions that I was selling on eBay. Okay. It was making me around about 200 quid, 250 pounds a month. Obviously, I, nothing, nothing I could sustain, but there was just a little glimmer there. And I thought, you know what? I've got to do this. I've got to do this now. It, it, this is comfort zone gone by a million. Do you know what I mean? To, to, mm. to think I've had this career, job, job, job. And now I'm thinking about financial security to go into this abyss of, wow, something I'm, I just don't understand yeah and my boss at the time um he said Mark why are you applying for voluntary redundancy you have got a career for life here this is you know I he, and, and he, I remember him saying to me you will regret this he said if wow. you do it you will regret this and I can, can you know what I mean and I just and that made me think he's not saying you know this might not be a good idea Mark he's saying you will regret this and and I'm thinking Oh God. Yeah. <laughs> you know, maybe I will. And then my parents, right. So my parents unbelievably supportive throughout my whole life. Um, if, if I do, if I want to go for something, they'll support me. If I get it wrong, they'll support me. And, and, and that's how it, how it's been. And when I said to them, I'm taking voluntary redundancy, I'm getting out of it. They were like, it, it's not a really good, you know, they, they usually they'll guide me, but it was more of a don't, 
don't do this, don't do this. Do you know what I mean? Because, and I get it from their point of view, you know, um, all they've known is jobs, you know, so they can, they can advise me on a job. They can advise me on, you know, what career path to take. There's no advice that they can give me on, um, on, on a running my own business. There's nobody um, outside, even friends, family, no, nobody runs a business. And I, you know, it was, it was a big thing. Um, I mean, my wife, um, she's got a bit of a background of entrepreneurship within her family. So her, her father, who's passed up, who passed away, he was an entrepreneur. So she's got that within her. Do you know what I mean? She has that, that, on, so she was, she could see it. She could see the possibilities, even though she's, you know, job for life kind of thing where she, where she is. Um, it was, a, she could see the, the opportunities and yeah, against everything that pretty much everyone said to me, I, I took the voluntary redundancy. Wow. What with let's, let's rewind. When everyone's saying that to you, your pay, your loved ones, the closest people to you who are saying this is could be a regret. Don't do this. Really think about your decision. Yeah. What 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 makes you go for it? You know, because a lot of people they'll get advice and that advice, people's opinions will keep them where they are and set them back years. For you, you did the opposite. What what pulled you to to make a decision to ultimately go towards the business element? I think I don't know if you've heard that story before, but it's um, it's actually I think it's a fake story. I mean, probably people have heard of it. I can't remember the, 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 what um, what war it was or anything. But have you heard the story when um, there's a there's a there's a tribe, or it's not even a tribe. It's a it's a it's a, it's a load of people. They they go and they're about to um, attack a. Um, a civilization and what they do is they burn they they take all the boats over and they burn the boats um really butchering that story but um but they burn the boats so the fact is they cannot now go back yeah mm. and they have to now fight on and i just felt it's almost like my boats are being burnt you know it's, it's not like I've, i'm the captain making this decision to um burn the boats the the, the captain is is the nca they they've burnt my boat by saying no to Exeter I can't I can't bring Philippa up to, away from her family and I don't want to be away from my family do you know what I mean and London was different because I had lots of friends up there um I didn't really know that many people in and around Bristol so it was a real um real wrench so I that's what I think it was it was a real it was a real push in that direction but I also think if Philippa like my wife if she had turned around and said it's not a good idea Mark you know you you know you you've got a job for life I wouldn't have done it I mean I would I wouldn't have yeah, uh, I really wouldn't have. It was because everybody, but she was the only one who was like, I think you should. So that was the that was the decision, probably. Wow. Yeah. Wow, absolutely. I mean, well done, Philippa. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, how important you think that is? So, you know, I've mentioned this on a podcast before, but the amount of conversations I have with people who are in the job and they're thinking about a better life and they want to go into business, but their partner's like, no, you know, the finances, you know, you know, think about things, the pension, even though these people are miserable, the other partner kind of stops them from getting them where they want to be for, for you. You know, how important has it been to, to your success in having Philippa support your dreams, your goals, your ambitions? What, so, so what the, um, how is important? Is what, how yeah, how, yeah. How important has it been for you, you know, in, in Philippa supporting your, your goals and your ambitions? Yeah, yeah, massive, massive. I mean, to to actually move forward into to um, create my own business, it's just it's changed life mm. like tenfold. Absolutely, um, it's given me. I mean, everybody says to you that um, you know, if you want free time, it's that's not the reason to get a job because you work more. But I don't, I don't work doing. I, I what my work that I do excites me I doesn't feel like it. work doesn't it doesn't and and I you know you you often hear this that um and people will still say it to me don't burn I mean I don't, I don't it's not like I'm working 60 78 hours a week or anything but um sometimes I will go into it and I'll be working a lot and people say don't burn yourself out now would you say I mean if if, if I said to somebody um what do you love doing okay I love um I don't know I love going on holiday and going to new places and visiting new places. You, you wouldn't turn around and say to them, right, okay, but if you do that for three months, you're just going to burn yourself out. You'd be like, well, no, you're going to be in a great place. Mm. And I feel like that every single day. You know I mean? I'm, I'm doing what I love 
and I'm progressing things. I'm working with people that I really want to work with who drive me, get to watch them on television um, at the weekends. It's, it's what I do recreationally. I do as my, my, my work now, you know? So I, I think I've been in that, that, that position throughout my whole life where I've been very fortunate to do something I love. Even when I was in the NCA um, socket, obviously there's been points of ups and downs. And, and I said, I, I went out there because I had to, because I wasn't enjoying parts of it. But even the bits I didn't enjoy within the NCA and soccer and things, they're a hundred times better than most, you know, most people would do would enjoy in, in, in their roles. Mm. And then to go into to this, I don't know, I just feel blessed really sometimes to have, to, to, to have enjoyed everything that I've done. Because if you think about it, and I know it's a, a cliche thing to say, but the majority of our life were working. Mm. Uh, I mean, obviously yeah, you're sleeping and you're, you're doing that sort of thing, but the majority when you're actively doing something is work. Mm. Now, if you're actively doing something that you don't like, if you're actively doing something that, you know, around that, it's not a good place to be. You know, you, 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 you don't get an awful lot of time in life. And I do think if you're wasting a lot of it in a role that you don't like, you, you, you're wasting your life. There has to be that balance of you can't just say, right, boom, off I go and, and um, go and enjoy the high life because, you know, we do need that money. We do need that income to help us to, to support. But there needs to be that balance. There needs to be, um, you cannot just be in a role and keep going for it because the money, you know, you have to then, because if there's any way that you can go into something that you love and you can just about get by, unbelievably good because mm. you know that if you can just about get by that will increase that will get better that will always improve because and you'll go full into it and you'll and you'll love every single day of making it improve as well yeah um so yeah that's yeah. that's what i think it's a great advice and then going from what you just said there actually let's talk about ebay so you made yeah. this decision and um you know you essentially take voluntary redundancy and you've got this glimmer this side hustle business you're making 200 ish pounds on these uh tapes right so talk to me about what happens next you've took voluntary redundancy you've burned your boats what yeah. happens next for, you, for mark yeah so i was really into that side of things so um, when i say meditation it's more like hypnotherapy stuff mm -hmm. um and i went and i did a more um advanced course on that and it was around not just solution focused hypnotherapy but it was solution focused therapy and brain-based therapy as well mm -hmm. and it's pretty much the life life's work of a guy um Crikey, he's just, I've just forgotten his name, which is terrible, um, which is really bad because he, um, I, you know, I've got my book in front of me here, by the way, as well. Let me just, yeah, <laughs> I'm just, just going to have to have a look. It's just been such a long, David Newton, there you go. David, David Newton. Newton. Is, yeah, absolutely phenomenal guy um, who I forgot his name. So if, if he ever watches this, massive apologies, David. <laughs> um, but yeah, so um, his, his life's work, basically. and. Um, really loved it and his life it's not his own thing that he's come up with he will be the first to say it, it's it's lots of different areas and I took that and I worked on that and I started working then mainly with people around anxiety and depression and mm -hmm. that was my big thing so I was doing more CDs around the hypnotherapy the meditation side now I'd gone from eBay to Amazon and that was phenomenal in terms of, of what that was doing for me um, but I was then working one-to-one -one with people around anxiety and, and, and depression, around giving them an understanding of how their brain operated from, you know, from, from, from that anxiety point of view, and then allowing them to take back control. It was brilliant, absolutely excellent. Um, but I was very progressive because I love it. You know, this is, this is the thing. When you're into something you love, mm. you take things to the next level, and you go and you go and you keep going with it. And, and I was doing that with um, with the procedures and things that I was doing. So I was, I was always reading like journal articles around how that brain of ours works. I'm always reading up about how can I apply this? How can I make this more effective in the work that I'm doing? And so from the work that David Newton had, my work started to stay on the same track, but started to kind of progress, you know, just like I'm sure he would say that he took lots of stuff from different people and made his progress. And from that, I started to get an, a really great, um, passion for performance mm -hmm. so we're not looking now at anxiety and depression we're looking now at performance and really there's a big big similarity between you know what's going on inside your brain anxiety depression performance all that sort of thing and um 
I got an opportunity then to work with some players at some football players at semi-professional level. And it worked everything I was doing with them. They were like, wow, I had no idea um, this happened and, um, around my brain and this, you know, and, and they were able then to put some other techniques into place and it was able to assist their game. And in fact, I remember one guy, um, we, we were working together and um, he was established in, um, in, this, in semi, he was 28, 29 years old, played there a long time, centre midfielder, doing really, really well. And we're having a conversation in one of the sessions we did about he'd never scored a hat-trick um, in football since wow. he was like, like a young, young lad. Yeah. And I was like saying, look, you know, we're working on how he's going to get in the right position, doing all these different things, having that self-belief, that confidence, that drive, determination, um, but also that intelligence to get in the right positions and things. And I remember that evening, it was the night before the game, I said, look, you, that, that hat trick, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if you go out and, and make that happen very, very soon. The next game, within the first 25 minutes, he'd scored a hat trick. Wow. You know, it was, it was, it was like a, wow. I think it was, um, you know, there's a lot of coincidence about it, but there was also a lot of the stuff that we, we, we had done. And I'd gone then from, from working with semi-professional players. And then I started going into league football. So the opportunity from that, because Plymouth is um, semi-pro, Plymouth Argyle, there's a, there's a connection there. I had an opportunity to work with a couple of um, league two players at the time. But my thoughts were, what I did, that kind of mental performance side is going to be sewn up. You know, I'm going to go in there. They're, they're going to just say, oh, yeah, we've got loads of people. We've got, you know, or, or we've got somebody who comes in, they work in, where they're working on it. They're absolutely brilliant at what they do. Um, because at the end of the day, you know, football is a massive industry, isn't it? You know, even at League Two level, got to be, got to be solved. And I went in, I had a conversation with a couple of the lads there. And, um, and they're like, wow, no, this, this sounds great. So I oh, okay, brilliant. So I um, started working with, with them, really good results. And then it just kind of built and built, mm. word of mouth, word of mouth. And then, he, I mean, it's just the biggest surprise to me is when I, you know, the higher I've gone, every level, it's like the multi-millions or even billion pound industry that it is, these players, so you can have a player who's worth 50 million pounds. If he's not performing well, he could now be worth 20 10 million wow okay. within six months all that money wiped off of his value now his performance unless it's down to injury that performance is nothing to do with his ability the performance is all coming with what's going on inside his brain you know wow. is he is he is he doing the right things is he make you know is he understanding if his performance goes downhill that's that's done so i'm thinking this has to be one of the biggest things in the game it has to be and as i'm going through the game i'm realizing it's not no, nobody's doing what I'm doing. And even now when I work with my players, I'm not saying, I always say to them, you're the expert of your game. You're the expert of football. Your coaches and your managers, they will, they will, they are the experts and they'll tell you how um, to improve your ability. All that sort of thing. When it comes to the brain, that's my domain, you know, and I will make sure that you know what to do. You have the tools available to you to play to your absolute maximum and know how to do it every single game. Now what you have is you have a 50 million pound player that's going to go 55, 60, 70 million rather than the other way. Mm. Um, so for clubs, I think it's absolute no brainer, you know, for, for, for them to do it. But the 99% of my work is with individual players now. Mm. Amazing, amazing stuff. So essentially, just a, a rewind. You've, you've gone from helping people with anxiety and depression uh, mm. through a uh, solution focused hypnotherapy and yeah. you've got the opportunity to basically help semi-pro footballers with the performance type of things mm -hmm. what type of you know performance do people come to you with is it like i want to um i don't know take uh, or have more goals i want to defend better i want to um you know be able to you know spot potential um you know other managers eyes you know what kind of things they come you with come you with uh, to you with sorry yeah, yeah. So, I mean, it's the, the, the major one really is the insecurity in football. You know, everyone thinks that um, footballers have it easy. You know, it's like, oh, we do they go? There's so much uncertainty in football. A player could be, you know, scoring goals, doing brilliant things one week, the next week they're not doing that and they could be scratching around for a contract. You know, it's, it's, wow. it's okay. a very cutthroat industry. So, um, but the, I mean, that was more of the lower level. Now, the higher levels, players are a little bit more. Um, they, they know if they don't play very well, somebody else is going to come into them and they, you know, their, their contracts are going to be fairly safe. They've almost got to get out of jail free card 
before they start hitting those bad times. Okay. Whereas League One and League Two, they're not performing. They're not going to get a contract. It's mm-hmm. it's very very cutthroat kind of kind of industry. Um, so there's 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 players that are kind of suffering a little bit around that. But most of the guy, time guys come come to me, they're just like. I, I want to improve. I, I, I know how players are starting to get an understanding of how important the mental side is to their game. You know, I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's the, the problem I think we've had in the past is we talk about the psychology of a player or the mm. mental resilience of a player. The, it's kind of a bit more fluffy terminology for me. And you, you know, for a player, it's like, what's my psychology? What's my mental? But at the end of the day, we're talking about the brain. And it doesn't matter if you're a footballer or a non-footballer. If you've got the wrong parts of your brain in control, yeah, if you've got the wrong chemicals that are running around, rushing around your, your body and brain, you're in big trouble. Yeah. If you're, you know how to manage that brain of yours to do the right things, to get the best parts of your brain in control, get the best chemicals for your energy, for your focus, your determination, for your improvement, and you get those going, now you can make massive, massive improvements to your game and, and even, your, even your life. So I'm starting to get that message out there a little bit more. And players are starting to, to see that. Starting, a big a big platform for me is, is Instagram, really, at the moment. That's where all the players are. And I've got literally hundreds and hundreds of pro footballers that, that follow me on there. And that's where they usually make um, make contact with me and say, look, you know, can we can we have a conversation about me working with you? And um, and, and that's what it what it comes from. And usually it's either they want to take a game to the next level or they've um, very, very, um, very small circle. They know somebody who's worked with me and they've said, oh, what's he like? And, and then they've had that kind of, oh, okay, well, I'm going to work with him as well. And, and that's that's how it's operated, really. Wow, absolutely phenomenal. And for those who listen, what is your social, what's your IG handle? Um, official Mark Bowden. Awesome, awesome stuff. Yeah. Um, great. So with regards to, um, you know, someone who wants to improve their performance or they might have anxiety around their performance and that they want to improve, yeah. what's like a you know obviously i don't want to go into the deep of all your your goodness but you know yeah. what's kind of one basic tip or strategy someone could have that they could use in their everyday life to help them perform better whether that's going to be in business a lot of our people are, are looking to go into business or yeah. uh, scale their business what's kind of one tip you could give that is going to help them perform better in life really in life yeah well the thing is we we there's lots of techniques there's lots of things that we we can employ but for me the foundational elements of every single thing i do comes down with like my model of the brain yep mm-hmm. that's the big thing get that understanding of what's going on inside your brain now you can start taking things to the next level yeah so one of the things that i i will say is that um so i'll give you a, literally a 60 second overview of my model of the brain yeah yeah so you have the red brain which is um the part that's there for fight or flight terrible for um playing football terrible for us in life yeah apart from if we are trying to fight a rival tribesman or a, uh, <laughs> a wild animal um then we have this other part of the brain which is the green brain this is your left prefrontal cortex really yeah but the, the green brain as i call it now, this is great for living your life off the pitch. It's it's slow, methodical, great way of thinking, confidence, feel good, all that kind of thing, but not good for off the pitch, uh, sorry, for on the pitch or performing. Yeah. So even even like now, if I was um if I was in my green brain, I'd probably be a little bit too relaxed mm. for this. You know, what I mean a little bit um, you know, it's one of those things of you know, if you're down the pub with your mates kind of thing, you know, having a beer or something, you might, you know, you just relaxed and there'll be a little bit of conversation here and there that, that, that goes on um and then you're you know you're dipping maybe to watch a bit of the footy or or whatever like that going on but the way that our brains operate and, and i have um players that come to me who experience a lot of stress a lot of anxiety a lot of nervousness before a game and i also have the other side of players that will come to me and they'll be so oh, you know i don't get any nerves i'm so relaxed so at ease and they see that as a really good thing mm. yeah and also those people that experience the anxiety and nervousness, they almost would, they look at those, if I, you know, mention anybody like that, they'll be like, oh, I really wish I could feel like that. You know, I really wish I would feel like that. Um, and my response to that is, no, you don't want to feel like that. We, we want anxiety. Anxiety is terrible. Yeah. Anxiety is horrendous for doing brilliant things. However, only in its raw element. So we've got the red brain, the green brain, and now what I call is the blue performance state. So the red brain is 
having loads of energy, loads of power, but the green brain now is controlling that red brain. Mm. Yeah. So what we have now is that raw goodness of the red brain. So you have, so the things, think about like fight or flight, what we're talking about, high levels of quickness. So a quickness of thinking, a quickness of movement in a bad way. Yeah. Um, and then we're, we're um, the elevation of um, strength. So when we're angry, it's actually a basic function to fight or run away. So we add that element of, of strength. So that's what that red brain gives us, all these really, really good things. But because we utilize them in, in the way that they're there to be utilized, you know, fight or run away, that green brain or any logical thinking around that dies. And it's just pure red brain, pure anxiety, pure nerves. But now what we do when that red brain comes up, and I say to all my players, the more anxiety you have, the more nervousness you have, embrace it. Love the anxiety. Love the stress that you have. Take it on board. So every time like, um, you know, you're feeling it, what your red brain will want to tell you is, oh, this is terrible. What if this happens? Everything's going to go wrong. Everything's really bad. Everything's terrible. And like I said, you know, I don't like public speaking. Yep. So before, um, before we even like, came on this show, you know, my red brain wanted to say to me, uh, you know, what if, what if this happens? You know, what if I, what if you come across like this? We're good. And then in terms of what I do is I turn around and I say to myself, right, that red brain, that's what it's trying to do. It, but it's building all that nervousness is building. What that is giving me now is quickness of thought. Yeah. Quickness of, of movement. It's making me more um, driven, determined, passionate about what I do. And if I enable myself to feel it and, and enjoy it and move my body in a way that empowers me, because again, the red brain, once you have that, it's going to make you, um, you know, do all this kind of thing. But if you empower your body, empower your thoughts around that, it's not just fluffy thinking. What you're doing, if you, if you analyze the brain, is your limbic system, which is the red brain, rather than sending electrical signals and blood to that red brain. Now, what you're doing is you're sending those blood and those electrical signals to the green brain. And now you're getting more in control. You're still having the benefits of the brilliance of the rawness of strength, confidence, you know, oh, it's not confidence, strength and, and drive and quickness of thinking, quickness of movement. But you've got more of a logical thought around it and you're, and, and you're taking it on board. So pretty much, you know, having that understanding of that and realizing that you can change just by the way that you think you can change which way the blood and electrical signals, electrical signals go but you also then release within the body and the brain chemicals and hormones that are going to assist you for performance and whether that, that's performance um on with, with your clients you know um because we're always performing aren't we we know we're always trying to elicit something from them or it's on the football pitch um whatever it might be if you can start thinking and moving in a way that's empowered. I love anxiety. I love that anxiety. I love what it gives me. It gives me so much drive, determination, motivation, quickness of thought, and it drives me forward and makes me go to the next level. Now, that's not just me saying, oh, you know, fluffy thinking. I've changed everything going on inside my body and brain now, and it's working for me rather than against me. Wow, I, I feel pumped just listening to that. That's, that's absolutely amazing. So what so what you're saying really in a nutshell is change your perspective of anxiety. Don't let it cripple you and think of it as a crippling thought or emotion. Instead, let it empower you and drive you forward if you control it in the right way. 100%, 100%. And that's it. Change your perspective. Really perfectly put because that perspective is what creates it. It's our thinking, isn't it? I mean, and anything could happen and where and everybody if when they don't understand this are so guilty even when people understand it they can be guilty of it as well but whatever happens does not cause anxiety or stress whatever happens to you does not cause it it's our interpretation our perception of whatever has happened that is what causes the anxiety so it is a thinking that creates different changes in what's going on inside the brain it is our thinking that changes the chemicals that are, that, that are moving around in your body or which chemicals are, are, are being injected into your body and brain um obviously naturally and um and you have all this stuff going on but it is our thoughts so when some people say oh yeah but you can't just change things with a thought you've just caused it with a thought you know what I mean yeah. the way that you're thinking has caused it and now because where you're thinking your body's done the same physiology as well will make you go in i mean if i if i came on the show now and i was and i was doing this i'd destroy myself you know what i mean I'd, I'd be sitting i'd be sitting here oh yeah yeah alex yeah that's really good all i would be doing now is fueling that red brain 
and, and, and taking away my, my strength, my power, my energy, my confidence. Um, but instead, I'll let it work for me rather than against me. Amazing. It reminds me of, reminds me of a story um, between a grandfather and his grandson and between two wolves. Have you heard it? No. Where, no. where essentially there's, uh, there's two the, the grandsons speak to his father and he says, um, tell me a story. The grandfather says, oh, there's, a, there's a battle on going on in, inside me between two wolves. Uh, one of the wolves is anxiety, depression, uh, hatred, jealousy, envy. And the other is love, contentment, drive, determination, passion. And the the boy, the grandson says, you know, which one wins? And the grandfather says, whichever you feed. Yes. And exactly what you're saying Love there, you, allow, you want it to, Love it. to, you know, feed the good anxiety, not kind of the, the bad one. Amazing. Um. So talk to me about yeah, your, your business in the that. element. Um, what are some of the challenges you've had in business? I, you know, taking a gutsy risk like that, you know, you've got your redundancy and then you go and pursue this thing that's obviously pulling you towards it and you, you, you implement brilliantly. But for you, kind of what other challenges have you had happen in business? Because obviously we all hear the success of a lot of entrepreneurs. And as you know, being an entrepreneur, it's freaking hard work, right? Um, what kinds of the challenges that stand out for you on your entrepreneurial so far? Yeah, um, I mean, numerous, you know, daily, weekly, monthly, you know, there's always things that come up. Um, but certainly in the football side of things, um, I'm not a sports psychologist. Mm. Yeah. So when I've gone in um, and it's it, there's no issues with the players, but any clubs, it, you, they won't. There's a real trepidation or a real um, dismissiveness around you know, you, you won't work with us because you're not a sports psychologist. Mm. And that's like the, the big thing. So there was a point in my career where I thought, well, I'm not going to be able to push myself through. So, you know I mean, I just thought, well, I, I'm not one of these guys. And I thought there was a time where I thought, well, actually, you know what, I'm going to do a degree and then a, a, a master's in, in, in sports psychology to enable that to happen. Mm -hmm. Now, all that would be for me would be to tick some boxes to be that, that person. Um, and I and and really, you know, it's and I've heard it all. I've heard it a lot with entrepreneurs as well that they have that that um, what's that 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 there's a saying, isn't there? Um, when um, you haven't got that belief in yourself, you know, you almost um, imposter syndrome. Yes, you, know, you have that imposter syndrome, and you hear it all the time. And I felt that, you know, I thought, crikey, I'm I'm am I just playing at this? Do you know what I mean? Am I just? I'm, I'm not really. Um, but all my results were saying the players are, are making massive results. Everything's once doing really, really well. And I, and they're not, they don't know any of this stuff. And, and I went from thinking, actually, I don't just um, not need it. I don't want it because a sports psychologist at a football club, no matter what we just talked about, how important the brain is, a sports psychologist at a football club has a ceiling of how much they would pay and even the Premier League levels, it is minuscule. You know, you think they've got a player who will be earning 200 grand a week. <laughs> and, um, you know, they'll play the, pay the sports psychologist 25, 30 grand a year. Do you know what I mean? If, 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 if they're lucky. Some, I mean, I, for example, I had a guy that I was talking with um, who was working with a League One club and they were char he was charging them 50 quid a day wow. um, to, to, to work with them. And, and I was like, well, do you know what? It's great that I'm not a sports psychologist. I I don't you know, if someone if if a club or said to me, uh, yeah, but we only play play sports. I'd be like, great. Well, I'm not a sports psychologist. I'm not here to do this. What I'm here to do is to make you a better team. I'm here to make sure your 50 million pound asset is now stays at 50 million while rather than gets 30 million knocked off. So I think that imposter syndrome is always something that's there. And I think what really, I mean, I've been quite fortunate really with what I do and how I do things has had an enormous amount of success. Mm. And because of that, it's very easy. If I feel that imposter syndrome, it's like, well, look, look what I'm doing. Look at the results. Look, look what's happening. Look at what people are saying. I mean, if you look at my, um, like behind me here, I have, so the way that I operate, so the way that I, I put my shirts up, they're not just signed shirts. Players that I work with, they, they do me some brilliant, brilliant testimonials. And I frame, so they'll send me like a match worn shirt, very geeky side of me. I love like my, my football memorabilia, but yeah. um, each one of them um, has like a, uh, the testimonial within, um, within the frame as well. Wow. Um, so, and these, I mean, I've got some on the floor here as well. I just, 
I need a big bigger office to um, to put them up on the wall now, and I'm getting them all the time. And what people say is just brilliant things, and it's like really really awesome things. I mean, if you go onto my website, which is just being updated now, um, and the more testimonials will be on there pretty soon. But it's um, topform.global. Um, if you go on there, you'll see some a lot of the testimonials, and they're not just oh yeah, great. Mark was really good to work with. They're really sort of like the work has been career change is the best thing I've ever done and, and wow. that kind of thing. Um, so it's with one you know, challenge has been that, but also it's been one that I've been able to get over fairly easily. Um, the other one probably was a big one is that it would be very, very easy for me. And a lot, I know a lot of people have kind of got into what I do in this, the, the mental side, the psychological side or whatever you want to call it. I, it's the brain that, at the end of the day but they've they've got into this within football and football doesn't pay very well like, mm-hmm. like i've just said around this arena and it's not given the respect that it should be given either mm-hmm. um because of that anybody who's been any good does either does other things on the side mm-hmm. or has completely come away from football so you know they'll work within business or they'll work with other, within uh, other disciplines and i've had the same you know i mean i've been offered um to work with UFC fighters, boxers, um, other athletes, Olympians, um, people in business, and financially, it would make a lot of sense initially. Yeah, you know, it would just it would be a really really good thing for me. But and this like going throughout, and and what I decided quite early on as I started to really get my teeth into this is that what I do, yes, of course, you know, it's the brain. It applies to business. It applies to boxing, UFC fighting. It applies to all that but I don't care. You know, for me, the focus is football. Mm. You know, if, if, if you decide you don't, pay, you know, this is what you pay. You don't pay that. You don't work with me. You know, that's fine. You know what I mean? Mm. It, I, I don't lower my prices because you have a ceiling of, 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 of working for. I'm, I've, I've built myself a nice reputation where I can actually turn around and say, okay, it'll cost me some money not to work with you, but I decide not to work with you. You know, mm. certainly. Um, so, you know, obviously I'm not, rude about it um even though sometimes internally i do feel rude you know about it i mean i sat down with so i had a um one of the players that i work with he's very close to a very very prominent guy within the game um and he linked me up to uh have a conversation with a couple of guys at a club and um i sat down and had a conversation with these guys and they were so dismissive I mean, I say dismissive, they weren't actually, they weren't dismissive, disinterested. Mm. It was like, you know, um, so I do a lot of YouTube videos where I'm talking to a camera. Yeah. yeah and obviously there's no one on the other end of the camera. Mm. It was like that in the meetings. Wow. Had, you know, it was like, you know, you, this this guy is very prominent. And he's obviously got these guys to, to have this conversation with me and they just, just didn't care. And I came up and I just thought there was a little bit of red brain anger um, yeah. on within me. And then I just thought to myself, well, you know, that's fine. Move on and, and go to other things. But it, that, to me, epitomised what the game is like. You know, it's everybody's really stuck in the way they do anything on the outside. It's like, no, don't want to know because uh, we do our own thing. If we always, or so we've, that's we've always done it, or it's a, it's a threat. Jimmy's you know, it's a threat against what they do. So, yeah, yeah I think for me, that's probably been the, a couple of the, um, the big things. Um, I have experienced a couple of times where financially it, there's been a big dip and it's been like crikey, you know, how do, what am I going to do now? What am I going to do? Um, and I think that the, the thing there to do when, when that, when those times get hard is to come away from that red brain thinking. It's not logical. It's emotional. It will want you to stay up and think about the solution, try and find that solution. Whereas the red brain doesn't do that very well. And you'll find you have sleepless nights and literally the way the brain, the brain, have you ever, you ever, um, you ever lost a set of keys before, right? And you've yes, lost that always. Set. Yeah, always, yeah. <laughs> um, you're thinking, where are those keys? And you're consciously trying to think about where those keys are, but you can't come up with the answer. Yeah. Now you can, you forget about it and you go on, maybe you do the washing up or something, or you're going to, but then all of a sudden, out of the blue, something hits you and you say, oh no, my keys, they're behind the thing, or I left them in the thing, but you weren't even thinking about it. Yeah, all the time where you were really trying to think about it. Yeah, because that's how our brain works. We, our conscious brain is minuscule compared to the resources of the unconscious where we store so much. In fact, the 
unconscious brain is around about 975,000 times more powerful than the conscious part of our brain. So the thing is, if you're conscious trying to think of something and you've gone red brain, you're worried that, oh my God, I need them, I need them, I need them, all that kind of thing, you will not come up with the answers or you're repressing the, the opportunity. And it's the same if you have financial problems or are there any issues that you have within your business, take a break. The break will help you to come up with the answer. It's not like you're taking a break so you can come back another time. The break is the answer. Meditation, yeah, seems like a fluffy thing. Get involved. It's really important of how your brain works. That's amazing because, you know, obviously, you know, when I have difficult times in business, um, you kind of want to stay close to your business to try and fix it and look for solutions. But what you're saying here is actually come away from it, have a bird's eye view of it, Try and, you know, not think about the problem and not, and by not thinking about it, you'll actually come up with a solution. Wow. Amazing. Um, also yeah. just going back onto the kind of imposter syndrome side of things, you know, it is, to, you know, to say the success you, you, you've got, you're, you're a best-selling author. You've worked with some phenomenal people all around uh, football. You've been in the media, such as talk sport, sun mirror sky sports, uh, and you get imposter syndrome. Um, and, you know, like you said, I don't think it'll, it won't ever go. Um, but for you, what it sounds like by overcoming it, you, you read your testimonials, you, you get results for your clients and that kind of keeps the imposter syndrome at bay. Is that, is that what you're saying there? Yeah. Yeah, it is. And I think, you know, it's, it's, it, although I don't do it, um, it's, it probably would be a really good technique and to have, um, your successes somewhere. Do you know what mm. I mean? So whenever you feel that way, you look at those successes and again, it's how your brain works. If you're, if you're red brain and now you go and you start looking at your successes, you're driving that blood and those um, electrical signals away from the red brain and you're creating different chemicals by looking at that. So it's a, yeah, nice work. It's a really good idea to have some successes that you just go back to. No matter how small those successes are, they'll stop you from thinking about how bad things are or how you're not this or you're not that. I mean, even the fact... So you'll, you'll have a lot of, um, um, obviously, police officers, ambulance people, um, you know, NHS workers, all these yeah. kind of things. And it's been a massive asset to my business, uh, having that background within football. And, and it will be, I mean, and, and even before that, wherever you go, it's a huge, huge asset that if, if you are thinking, oh, yeah, yeah, I can't succeed, look back at some of your successes within your role. And this, one of the successes within your role is the fact that you had that role. You know, mm -hmm. it could be that basic because, you know, when I, ever I speak to people, I tell them about my background instantly, they're like, wow, wow. You know, and, and, and I think we forget sometimes um, how brilliant we've operated at certain points in the past and, and, the, and the improvements that we've made for people's lives. You know, you, you might think, oh, yeah, yeah, but, you know, because we can become very cynical, can't we? Do you know what I mean? When we're in that job all the time doing the same things, even when you're, you know, you, you might be a nurse mm -hmm. and you'll get, you know, you, you know, the last two years you've been annoyed, you know, coming home after your shift. But when you're on that shift, you've made a massive difference. Even when you've been annoyed, mm -hmm. you've, you've been, you've made differences to people's lives. And I think it's just something that you can feel very, very proud about if, you, you know, but still take away into your, into your next role. And, you know the, the amount that you can bring that into your story as well I don't and it's only recently when I've started to really start to bring that into my story because you know you think of it as normal because you've mm. lived a life um where all the time you're around people that do the same thing yeah and when, you, when you're that you you it just feels like that's that's just normal that's what we do but actually it's very exciting you know what I mean and it and, it, and it's very very noble, very, you know, it's just all those, all those things that, that people in the, in, in our area, whether you, like I said, if you're a police, nurse, doctor, um, whatever, you know, it's, it's some brilliant things that everybody has, has done for people. Amazing. Amazing. That, that was actually one of my questions based on your, um, your previous um, past in the NCA, um, the British Transport Police. What's some of the skill sets do you believe you've brought over into the world of business from from that part of your life? Um, confidence, I think, is one of them, and and probably and there's this. Yeah, quite often I have a conversation with people, and certainly when I first moved moved over into business, a couple of people picked up and said, 
you, you bet you used to be a police officer or, you know, military or, or something like that. They, they have that kind of way about you that it breeds that confidence. And, and, and I do feel, um, like I said, okay, public speaking, it's, just, it's always been a, a big, big problem for me, but that confidence that that, 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 that has given you, I mean, you know, there, there's almost sometimes an, an, an arrogance that, that possibly does come with that sometimes, but I don't think that potentially is a, is a bad thing unless you're being an arsehole. You know yeah. what I mean? Arrogance can be a good thing sometimes if um, if you portray it the, the right way. And I think- Self-esteem, right? Self-esteem, yeah, yeah self-esteem. Having that real strong um, self-esteem. And you know, there'll be some people that don't feel that they, they've got it. You have got a self-belief. If you're a police officer, a nurse, or anyone like that, um, you have got that self-esteem within you if you just realize what you've done and what you've achieved. Sometimes, you know, you, that, that can dwindle. But yeah, for, for me, um, huge levels of, of confidence and self-belief um, from, from skill set. Um, surveillance, I don't know really, um, you know, if, uh, if that's really assisted me. Um, Being confidential, I suppose. If you've got to be confidential with your clients, then I suppose you've got that, that trust element because you've got, you know, big jobs when you was in the police. That's, do you know what? That's a really good one, actually. And that's something, because I was, um, I was DV cleared because we were dealing with, with a lot of um, secret, top secret stuff. And um, so almost the highest level of, um, uh, of, of um, what's it called? Security clearance. Yeah. Uh, so whenever I'm working, so I, I had, for instance, I had, a, um, I had an agent that came uh, that, that spoke with me quite recently. Uh, I was working with one of his uh, one of his players. I was start, just about to start working with one of his players, mm -hmm. and um, I mean, I won't even tell you the clubs that he's potentially going to go to this summer because it might give the game away who he is. But um, the, the best clubs in Europe basically are after him. And um, he, the agent actually said to me, um, you know, about signing non non disclosure agreement, and he was a very very you know little bit of I could sense a nervousness about me working with him because he just didn't know me and, and what I was about. I was able to say, these are the players I've worked with, et cetera. But to be able to say, look, my background is this. I've, I, you know, I've, um, I've worked with top secret material from the government um, and they've entrusted me with that. If, if that got into the wrong hands, we're looking at catastrophic, um, and probably delusions of grandeur because the, the top secret material that I've um, that I've ever seen is probably you can write on the back of a postage stamp. But you know you could actually say that yeah. if the government have entrusted me with this, then um, I can look after your player and I will treat them with the same confidentiality I would treat any top secret material with. So yeah, it's a nice one, but yeah, yeah, good point. Yeah, it builds that trust absolutely. Um, mm. What what do you think's been some of the biggest uh, learning that you've had from the people you, that you work with um, what's kind of been that light bulb moment for you working with these 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 athletes um the insecurity that they experience um is a lot of insecurity. i mean some of the i mean a lot of the players that i work with are real alpha guys i mean it's an, it's an alpha industry anyway um like high levels of professional football um but you know, and the guys that I work with, they're almost like the alpha guys within it. They, they're just the guys that are like, you know, some people would be like, oh, I'm not doing that. These guys are so self-confident and, and um, you know, sure of themselves. It's like, right, I want that. I'm having that. And they'll go, they'll go and see me and we'll work. But even there, it's it, there's a lot of insecurity with it within the game. Um, and if you think about it, it's just pure insecurity of contracts. Am I going to be in the team this week? Am I going to be in the team next week? Um, where am I going to be playing next season? geographically, you know, as well, as well. And my family, you know, what's going to happen with my family? They're going to move with me. Um, I'm going to be playing away from home and working away from home. It's, um, yeah, that, that, that's a big one. And, and what, it's, what it's made me realise is um, if I, because I, I tell you what, I, I, on television, I watch three things. Yeah, I watch football, The Apprentice and um and, and dragon's den that's pretty much yeah. me do you know what i mean I, I love those things and um that's, that's about it and i remember i i met up uh, i was in i was having a conversation with one of my players actually at a hotel in the in the foyer and um i just finished with him and i was walking out and i incoming was nick hewer remember nick hewer from the apprentice yeah great yeah yeah, yeah yeah yeah, yeah. And I thought, I've got to go and speak to him. I've got to go and talk to this guy. So I've gone up to Nick Hewer and, I'm, and, I'm, and I just, 
Do you know what I mean? I've just come across <laughs> as an absolute imbecile. And it's like, you and I have got nothing in common and I'm trying to force myself like to, to have a conversation. And it was just the most awkward moment. And really for me, I was out of my comfort zone as well, talking to this guy. He was like, you know, here. And mm. I was like, here. Um, and that, was, that wasn't that long ago either. It wasn't very long ago at all. Yet I work with very, very, very high level pro footballers. Mm. And when I work with them, I never get that feeling. I never get that feeling. I, I feel for the players that I work with. And it's a really strange thing. How can you feel for a player that's earning hundreds and hundreds of thousand pounds you know, a week? But actually, it's a hard thing. It's a hard thing. We often hear, um, you know, players get a lot of abuse. And I'm not even talking about the race abuse, which is disgusting. But, yeah. you know, the players get a lot of abuse for playing badly. Yeah. And I always hear people saying, look, yeah, but if I was earning £100,000 a week, you know, I, I'd be able to take that. And I get it. And I and, and I, I feel the same. If you were gonna if you if you said to me, work for two um, work with be that get two hundred thousand pounds for the next two weeks and get that kind of abuse, mm. I, I'd do it. Mm. Yeah, just like anybody else would would. Yeah, because it um however it doesn't stop there. You know, you don't this is what people think. It's like, oh yeah, but if I was earning that amount of money, I'd take the abuse. You would for a couple of weeks. Mm. But this then it doesn't become about the money it becomes a real ongoing thing. Mm. You've got to deal with every time you pick up a paper, there could be something about you in there. Every time you go on to Twitter, there's hundreds of people, thousands of people that hate you and are saying horrible things about you. Um, and for me, you know, that's why whenever I work with a player, I don't ever think, oh, wow, you're so lucky. You're so fortunate. I work with players thinking, I want the very best for you. Um, and I don't, th and, and then also as well, you know, Players work, they, they, they're they off for a few weeks now, but usually throughout the season, they're working um, during the week, they're working weekends, they're working evening evenings, they're working Christmas Day. They'll be in Christmas Day, they'll be working Boxing Day, they'll be working New Year's Day. So, you know, it's a, and, and every player that I work with will say it's a very, and they're, they're so grateful for the privileged position they're with. Every player's like that. But I actually see it as, difficult mm. really difficult mm. and something that I wouldn't want you know something that I I love my place being working with these players and being able to sit down and watch them do their thing would I really you know because a lot of people say are you living out your dreams no I've never had a desire to be a professional footballer and now even less so do you know what I mean I think it's a very 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 hard thing um to deal with and I, and I wouldn't want it it's exactly the same. So when I always wanted to become a cop growing up when I was 17 onwards, always wanted to do it, became a special, became a DO. I was like, right, I'm going to become a cop. But when I was surrounded by cops on a more regular basis, I was like, no way do I ever want to become a cop now? Because I know what actually the inner circle is all about. I know the problems and the mindset problems they go through and the family problems they go through. And I wouldn't want to put myself through that. So what you're saying there is that having empathy and understanding has enabled you to connect with your audience. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, why people work with you as well. Cause they, you get it. Yeah. 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 It is. I think it is that empathy. That's, yeah. that's the big thing. And I think there's a lot of people that would sit down with these footballers and be like overawed by them or almost sometimes a little bit, maybe, you know, you're nothing special. Why are you getting all this and things? And, you know, almost a bit of jealousy there, but yeah, like I said, like you say, is empathy. I mean, a lot of the testimonials that I've had have said that people, that, that the, my ability to be able to relate to a footballer and what they're going through and things is of, is of a high level. Um, and that is just, yeah, yeah, it's, it's an empathy thing for sure. Amazing, amazing. What's been one of your highlights? If you could pick one that puts a smile on your face in business, um, what's kind of one thing? Could it be someone you've worked with, someone you've got a compliment from? What is it for you personally? Um... Oh, that's a really good, really good question. Um, oh, one of the highlights. Um, I think probably the biggest for for me, testimonials. When players are happy to say things, it's it's huge. It's huge. And um, you know, recently I've had some very very good level testimonials. There's a lot of players that still want to keep things um, behind the scenes. Um, but for me. It was probably, um, you know, appearing in the newspaper is always a nice thing and appearing on media in, in the media is a, is a really nice thing as well. But for me, the one thing that really sticks out is that um, March last year, 
Yeah, so very, very recently, and it was March, yeah, it was March last year. Um, I mean, I'd had a couple of testimonials from really decent, uh, some really good level players before, um, but it was then that I asked a couple of my players, oh, would you mind just doing a couple of testimonials? And they both did. Um, and it just kind of kickstarted everything for me, really. Mm-hmm. And, and we're only talking, like we said, it's like, you know, I'd had some success, but that was when really people started to really take notice. And Kevin Stewart, um and Danny Bart um at Stoke City um you know like I said I've ever worked with with with, with players um on a lot level higher level but those guys and 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 both of those to be honest are your alpha guys as well and I think that's another reason is that you know what it's like it, within anything you the trendsetters you know you're not going to have the, the the meek that that that, that 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 make things acceptable you know mm-hmm. it's these guys um and Kevin Stewart quality lovely guy brilliant guy really humble and um you know he uh they did get relegated his, his, his team that he was playing for last season um and he got drawn into that kind of the relegation and, and things and, and unfortunately on his cv but his drive his passion was always there and he's got promoted this season which is you know what he deserves and danny bar of oh, crikey you know he um he's the alpha most alpha most guy that I, that I probably worked with, you know, or want certainly up there. You know, you say about going through wars to get a win, he will go through wars to get to a war to go through. Do you know what I mean? He's yes. a phenomenal guy. And to have those testimonials, to be able to put them then up on my website, that just for me escalated things. And it and they were brilliant testimonials as well. So yeah, yeah. That would be yeah. the one thing. Yeah. yeah. Social proof is so important in business. It just allows people to say, yep, this guy's legit. This guy's safe. It's with, with our audience, with, with police officers, naturally, because they're, they're jobs, they're going to be skeptical. Yes. And for us, after that first co or those first 10 officers joined Shift Success back in 2018, that's where we started to, to, to take off a little bit as well, which has been, which has been pivotal, really. Um, great. Okay. So where do you want to see yourself in the future? You know, where you are right now, where you've been, reflection on all the amazing stuff that you've achieved. Where do you see yourself going in the future with with your company? Um, I, do you know, I, I, I've thought about this and um, I think about this a lot. Um, and I've got like my, my thing up there um, that is what I look at every day around what I want to achieve. And pretty much what that is, is I want to be, um, I want to change football. I want to. I want to. Um, my methods, my what I utilize with the players. I want it to be, and I don't. I don't mean like you know, like a, a little pebble in the ocean kind of thing. I want to make this the biggest thing. As I said, you know, you've got um, a, a fifty million pound asset that can become a twenty million pound asset. Mm-hmm. That's thirty million pounds that someone can lose overnight. And in, and and I did a video around this quite recently around Sebastian Haller. Um, he was he went to West Ham for forty five million. 18 months later, he was sold for 20 million. Now, I don't care who you are. You don't, not one football club can afford to lose 25 million just like that. And that's one player. Um, and I want to be, I want to keep positioning myself as that person to go to for that kind of thing. Um, and because like I said, you know, I work with these players and they don't really, and the club certainly don't realise just how important this is, which is, which is ludicrous to me. And that's why I want to be, I want to change football. I want to, I want to make such an impact upon football um, that it's known. Do you know what I mean? That it's, that it's known. I think I'm having an impact on football for sure, um, but it's nowhere near where I want to go. I want to take this as far as possible. Absolutely amazing. Love that. I want to change football. What a vision. That's absolutely phenomenal. I've got to ask. I'm sure yes. people who are going to listen to this are wondering, who do you support? Plymouth Argo. Okay. Okay. Awesome. We're just, we're just... Plymouth, the, the mighty, the mighty greens. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, when I was in Plymouth the first time before I moved away, um, I followed Plymouth a little bit. Arsenal were my big team. Yeah. Right. Okay. Then when I moved away, it was all about Plymouth. So, um, you know, and, and people who are watching this now, if they're, fr- if they support Argyle, they'll say, why are you referring it to Plymouth? Because everyone refers to Plymouth as Argyle. But for me, it's not, you know, I, I want to see Plymouth do well. And that's not just the club. The, the the area everything so that's why um i support plymouth argyle <laughs> amazing amazing um for anyone who's thinking about going into business you've took a, a a great risk for your life you've you've changed your life through business you you do what you love every single day which is amazing for those who are 
feeling a bit bored with their jobs like you were, for those who feel a bit trapped, for those who have anxiety around having this different life, wondering if the grass is greener, but that anxiety is holding them back. That fear is holding them back. That comfort blanket is holding them back. What advice can you give? You've been there, you've done it. So what advice could you give for our listeners who may be in that situation? Yeah. Um, so I would say two things there. One is explore. Keep exploring what you potentially want to go into and explore. Um, you know, I don't necessarily mean identify, because if you're looking at identifying something, you're really pigeonholing yourself into to what you're looking for. But explore what way where you could go. And then if you are really looking at, at doing it, recognize what that anxiety is is it something i mean if i if i said to myself right oh you know i, I want to jump ship now i'm gonna go and i'm gonna um what's what's my job gonna be and it's something absolutely ridiculous you know but i think you know no one's buying this sort of stuff but i can make it as a business now is my anxiety doing what it should do then saying look actually that's not the right thing to do or recognize is my anxiety just because I'm getting out of my comfort zone, just because, you know, it's something that's going to be new to me because at the end of the day, the brain doesn't like change. Yep. And, um, you know, there's a quite, a, quite an interesting, sort of, uh, um, the reason why we believe that the red brain doesn't like change. And that is if you were back in the day and you were going from village A to village B and you've done that every single day of your life, every time you go there, you might be a little bit open eyed, make sure everything's safe, but you'd go from village A to village B. If one day you're walking from village A to village B and there was something blocking your path and now you had to go out and you had to go through a forest or something, do you know what I mean? Around into a forest and back in. Your red brain now is going to be, this is bad. You know, mm. it's going to be gripping you now. And that's why, and it's, and it's a good reason. Is, you know, you're, you want you to be on high alert to make sure there's no danger. And that's why our brains really, we don't like change. You know, even in like change of food, well, that mm. new food could be poisonous to us, you know, back in the, back in the day. And, and everything can be life-threatening. But none of this is life-threatening. None of, none of your anxiety you experience is life-threatening. So just take a step back and look at yourself. Are you getting anxious? Are you worried because you're coming out of your comfort zone? Or is there something that you, you, you know, is it the right thing to do? Um, but I would say, you know, most of the time, those anxieties will be there if you've got a great idea. And they'll hold you back if you've got a great idea because they don't want you to get out of that comfort zone. But, you know, if it, if it is that, you know, I'm not going to tell you to go and do it, um, but I think you should. <laughs> amazing, amazing stuff. Um, this has absolutely been a phenomenal um, show, this episode. I've took so many lessons for myself and I know our, our listeners will, will take plenty away from this as well. Um, what I'm going to do, guys, is leave the uh, links to the, um, Mark's website and also his social media so you can give him a follow and check out what the amazing work is up to. But Mark, one of the last questions that I like to ask everyone who jumps on the Shifts to Success um, podcast is... Mm -hmm. What does entrepreneurship mean to you? Um, it's the ability to recognize, I think, recognize opportunities. Um, and that's what it, what it all boils down to. Yeah, that, that would be my answer, I think. It's the ability to, to, to recognize opportunities and then having um, the confidence in yourself to go and take those opportunities. Absolutely amazing. Absolutely amazing. I completely agree. Um, Mark, thank you so much for your time today. It's absolutely been phenomenal to actually have you on the show. I've, I, again, I've, I've learned so much. Uh, your mindset is so intriguing. And, um, you know, if anyone listening, um, you know, listen twice, listen a third time, especially around, you know, Mark's story, dealing with anxiety, the red brain, the blue brain, the green brain. It's going to be an absolute game changer for you. And, uh, and yeah, I hope you take plenty from it. Um, Mark, again, big thank you. And uh, guys, I'll leave you to watch the rest of this in the Facebook group and I'll see you on the next episode. Take care. Bye-bye. Brilliant. Thank you.